I'm here at Stanford Medical School with Neil Gesundheit, who's a faculty, med me faculty member here at the med school. Hi, so. And so what are we going to talk about? Well, the topic for today is endocrinology, which is the study of hormones. And um, the word hormone is derived from the Greek word, which means arouse the activity. And what hormones do is they're chemical messengers that are made at one part of the body and typically go to another part of the body to, as uh, suggested, arouse the activity and give function to um, uh, another uh, organ. So they're, they're essentially kind of signaling, way, way to communicate between one part of the body and the other. Exactly. They're very sophisticated communicators. I think that's a perfect term. And I think the other way to think of it is our body communicates in some ways directly. For instance, nerves um, innervate muscle. Right. And when you want to contract your muscle, you give a signal from your brain, it goes down the nerve, and it directly attaches to the muscle and causes it to contract. Whereas hormones are more like the Wi-Fi of the human body. They're wireless. They are made um, at one place. They go into the bloodstream, which is like the airwaves, if you will. And then they, um, uh, they uh, work on another part of the body at a distance without, without directly connecting um, uh, to that part of the body um, uh, mechanically. And are hormones, are they a specific type of protein or a specific type of chemical? Or are there really anything that does what you just described? It's pretty much anything, but they fall into two major categories. They're small molecules that typically derive from amino acids. Mm -hmm. And those molecules are just, oh, 300 to 500 at most uh, Daltons, which are molecular mass units. Okay. Up to large proteins that can be hundreds and hundreds of amino acids in size. I see. So anything, anything that just really has this signaling function. That's right, would be considered a hormone. Right, right. And the other thing is we talk about hormones in three sort of subcategories. We call some of them endocrine hormones where they really get into the bloodstream and work at a, at a far distance. And we'll give some examples with your diagram right there in just a minute. But there are others that are called paracrine hormones. Um, and paracrine hormones are more regionally active. So they might be made, let's say, in one part of the body and work within a small distance of that site of synthesis. And then the third category, which is less common, would be autocrine hormones. And the autocrine hormones are actually made directly at one cell and work on that same cell or in the cell right next door at a very, very small distance. I see. Are these things, uh, you know, when you work, so the endocrine hormones, I, I think I have a mental model for it. They're, they're kind of released and far away in the body someplace. If they're picked up by the right receptor, they'll, they'll have the right function. The paracrine hormones, is their effect small because they only are able to travel a small distance, or, or is it something else? Uh, typically, the paracrine hormones um, do get into the bloodstream, but the concentration of the receptor, the receiving end, as you suggested, is right close by. So it tends to make a paracrine hormone work regionally is that the high concentration of the receptors are very close to the site of synthesis. I see. I see. And the same with autocrine is often they're made and there's a very high concentration of the receiving end right at that cell, uh, right next to that cell. And this might be a silly question, but you know it's called endocrinology. Are, are there are there paracrinologists? Uh, well, I, I, it's a good point. I don't think so. I think we just uh, perhaps because the paracrine function of hormones was discovered later, I we, see. we still carry this all under the umbrella of endocrinology. Right. So the, all of hormones is endocrinology, even though endocrine hormones are the ones that act at far distances. That's right. I think that's a good way to summarize it. Right. Now, I, I like the diagram that you created here because it illustrates some of the major endocrine organs, the ones we'll be focusing on in later lectures. So the first one that you showed very nicely in the head at the base of the uh, brain is that orange uh, structure, and that would be the pituitary gland. That's right. And the pituitary gland is called the master gland because from the pituitary, we make hormones that work on yet other organs. Right. So I'll give you an example. One of the hormones that's made by the pituitary is called thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. And after it leaves the pituitary, it goes into the circulation and it acts on the thyroid gland where there are high receptors for TSH on the surface of the thyroid cells. And it stimulates the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone, typically thyroxine T4 or triiodothyronine T3. Those would be the two main circulating thyroid hormones. And what do those do? Those regulate metabolism, they regulate appetite, they regulate thermogenesis, they regulate muscle function. They have widespread activities on other parts of the body. But it kind of upregulates or downregulates the entire body and the metabolism. That's right. 
So someone with hyperthyroidism would have very high metabolism. You, you may know the, the classic picture of someone with a high heart rate, rapid metabolism, weight loss. That would be someone with excess amounts of thyroid hormone. And then you see pretty much the inverse picture when someone has a deficiency of thyroid hormone and someone with hypothyroidism. So it's critical to maintain just the right amount of almost all of these hormones, and the thyroid hormones are good examples of I that. See. The, but the ultimate the, regulation the, is from that pituitary Right, this is kind of the TSH. master one. It sends a signal there, and then that kind That's of does right. the... That's right. And we'll talk later about feedback loops because how does the pituitary know when to stop making TSH? And basically, like a thermostat, it can sense the levels of thyroid hormone. And when those levels are just at the right level and not too high, it'll decrease the amount of TSH it makes. If the levels are too low, it'll increase TSH to try to stimulate the thyroid gland to make yet more thyroid hormone. Very cool. And what else do we have here? Okay, so the other hormones, some of the major ones, the pituitary, in addition to making the thyroid stimulating hormones, it makes a hormone called ACTH, adrenal corticotrophic hormone, which acts on the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal is that gland exactly that sits on top of the kidney. And the outer layers of the adrenal gland are the uh, adrenal cortex, and those are stimulated uh, by ACTH. And they don't, they're not related to the kidney. They just sit on top there. They're structurally right. there. Right. They're, they're related only in the sense that they, the blood supply um, is rich, like the kidney's blood, blood supply, and they happen to sit above the kidney. Um, and they're called adrenal because they're adjacent to the kidney, which oh. is the renal part. Well, that should have been obvious. I never but, that. but they don't per se uh, you know, uh, filter blood or do any of the key functions that the kidney subserves. I see. And what, what are the, what's their role? So the adrenal glands make um, the adrenal hormones like cortisol, which regulates um, glucose metabolism and is important to maintaining blood pressure and well-being. And then it makes uh, mineralocorticoids like aldosterone, which is important for regulating salt and water balance. You also have adrenal androgens, which are somewhat important. And those three hormones are the main hormones made by the adrenal uh, cortex. I see. The ACTH primarily regulates the cortisol and the adrenal androgens, and there's another system that regulates the uh, mineralocorticoids that we'll talk about later. Okay, and we have a few more organs here. Yeah, so uh, also out of the pituitary, we make lute luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. Those would be abbreviated LH and FSH. LH and FSH. And those act on the gonads. So in the male, it'll act on the testis, and in the female, it'll act on the ovaries to uh, stimulate the development of sperm in the male and uh, oocytes or eggs in the female and also the production of gonadal steroids, primarily testosterone in the male and estradiol in the female. Right, right. And are, are we missing anything? Well, there are two other hormones that um, also uh, derive from the anterior pituitary and those mm -hmm. would be growth hormone that's right. critical for optimal growth of long bones. Um, uh, the pituitary really does do a lot. It does, <laughs> yeah. And so that would so the target HGH, there would be right? human growth hormone. Yeah, human right? growth hormone, and that would act on long bones, for instance. And then we would have prolactin, which is important uh, in women for um, lactation, being able right. to breastfeed after delivering a child. And, and insulin is insulin is key, but it doesn't come from the pituitary. So now we're going to work so our way down a little right. bit. We talked about the thyroid gland right. making thyroid hormone, and then when you get to the pancreas, which is that mm. yellow structure right in the middle. Inside the pancreas, there are uh, small islands called the islets of Langerhans, um, and the islets within the uh, pancreas make endocrine hormones uh, like uh, insulin and glucagon. Right. But insulin is vital. Without insulin, you have diabetes. Right. And without insulin, you don't uh, transport glucose into muscle and remove glucose from the bloodstream normally. Right. And that uh, the absence of insulin can produce all of the symptoms of diabetes that we'll talk about later. Right. And it, it seems just structurally, you have the pancreas right here, you have the adrenal glands right there, that they're all near those kind of that interchange on the, because the, they're all so important to, to yeah, that, get to where they need to get to. That, that's a good observation. They, they all have a lot of venous um, drainage from them so that when they make their hormone, it gets into the bloodstream rather quickly because they are vital structures. Very cool. So I think I think we could leave it there, and, and then in the next video, you have some pictures that I think would be pretty interesting. Okay, yeah. In the next video, we'll talk about sort of how you have to have the right amount of the hormone or else things go awry. Very cool. Thanks a bunch.